Well, everyone, I believe that it has been about that minute and a half mark. And as Bill would say, we don't want to punish anyone for being on time. So we're going to get started with our webinar. Thank you everyone for coming. As you can imagine, we're very glad to have had the opportunity to present to everyone today. Uh, Dr. Laffer has been so gracious to give us some of his time. And one of the things that uh, we'd like to do, of course, is give him plenty of opportunity to speak. Uh, so before he does, I wanted to introduce our guests as well as introduce the people that will be presenting before Dr. Laffer. So uh, my name is Enpo Tu. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at My Financial Coach. One of the things that we do, of course, is work with individuals on their financial planning, specifically doing the planning and modeling for them. This means that oftentimes when there are when there is so much uncertainty in the world and people want to get some understanding of what happens uh, for their own personal life, if markets go sideways, inflation goes up or things of that nature, uh, we are able to give some clarity using numbers, graphs and things of that nature. So our guest today, Peter Hibbard from CBC Financial. Afterwards, we would love to introduce Dr. Arthur Laffer. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd actually like to now move on and introduce our next presenter, Peter. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to present. And I'm going to uh, open up your next few slides, but I would like you to give a quick introduction of yourself and your firm. Uh, so that way we're able to get a better understanding of yourself and, and also what you do. Yeah, I'm going to talk about our taxes voluntary and um, in particular, a particular strategy we developed to call the STAR strategy. STAR stands for Save Taxes Retire. And I have, as you can see here, I have a family business. My son-in-law, Tim, and my son, Jamie, were, have worked for me for a number of years. And we're located in Columbia, Maryland, halfway between uh, Baltimore and your favorite tax city, Washington, D.C. So when the STAR strategy is all about sequentially positioning retirement plan assets so they are not only income tax-free, but also estate tax-free. And I'm gonna talk about how you do that. Next slide. My favorite judge, uh, Supreme Court Justice Learned Hedge said, it, um, you're not bound to pay the highest taxes possible. It's not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. And I'll give you an example of voluntary tax. Under a 2020 New York University uh, study, the, uh, I believe the estate tax is a voluntary tax because if you look at the 40% tax rate that people have to pay on large estates, when the, in their study, they found out that these large estates, when they're settled, were only paid about 2.1% in the state taxes. And that is because people pay estate taxes either because they're, as a taxpayer, they're not paying attention, or number two, they don't have the advisors who have the knowledge, skill sets, and tools to implement strategies to avoid the, the estate tax. So the estate tax is uh, totally for the most part, unless you're not paying attention, as I said, uh, a tax that does not need to be paid. And the expected wealth transfer in the next uh, 10, 15 years is over $765 billion. And that will, will, for the most part, go untaxed. Next. But I want to talk about in the STAR strategy and what is the most promoted employee benefit? 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, TSAs, 457. And why are they the most... Uh, talked about promoted employee benefit. And that is because in the, you get in the contribution phase, and remember there's three phases of uh, cre uh, creating a wealth. The contribution phase is number one is what's the tax nature of it? Well, you get a tax deduction when you put money into 401ks. And then in phase two, as it grows, it grows tax deferred. Is that all there is? And uh, that's, uh, that's the title of a song from Peggy Lee in 1969 when I was in the Foxhole in Vietnam listening to her sing. Is that all there is? Well, let's talk about the third phase, the distribution phase, because most uh, advisors will tell you, oh, there's nothing you can do. You got to pay taxes on all that money you put in there and everything you earned in there. So every nickel, dime, and penny that comes out of your retirement plan assets is fully taxable in the distribution phase. And I'm here to tell you that's not necessary. Next. Uh, and Americans have become wealthy for, uh, in the uh, 401ks. Fidelity in, in 2021 reported there are over 400,000 401ks that have a million, a million dollars in their 401ks and over 340,000 that have a million dollars just in their IRAs. 
And that's just Fidelity reporting. It's not the other uh, investment houses. Next page. But this is the more this is the better average of the kind of money you have based upon income and uh, age. You can see the balances uh, run from eight thousand up to one hundred ninety six or two hundred thirty seven thousand. But here's the problem, as uh, my, the prior speaker talked about, Tom Martin, is that as Americans we have twenty nine trillion in that piggy bank, and Uncle Sam is sitting there fishing to get his piece of that because ultimately you're going to pay somewhere between 20 and 50% tax, income tax on that money you have in your qualified plan. And if you're fortunate enough to be a high net worth individual and you have to pay estate taxes on that, your tax rate between income and estate taxes could uh, approach 75% you'll lose in taxes. And it's totally unnecessary. Next. Our tax code is designed to take money from us, but it also giveth. So it takes and gives. In 1913, when the tax code first came out, you could print the whole doggone thing in four pages. Today, if you wanted to print the tax code, you'd have to print over 70,000 pages. But here's the point is that uh, the tax code uh, not only takes, as I said, but gives, but there's deep buried in those tax codes and regulations, there's golden nuggets of tax law that let, allow you to keep more of your money. Next. Again, my favorite judge here, it says in America, there are two tax systems, one's for the informed and one for the uninformed and both are legal. And that's my point is that if you're dealing with an advisor who's informed and knows the, uh, the golden nuggets in the tax code that they can pull out and help you pay less in taxes, that's the type of advisor you wanna work with. Next. And here's uh, the two tax code nuggets that created the star system. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, the founder of uh, <clears throat> MTV. Innovation is taking two things that exist and putting them together in a new way to create a new product. And so the IRS issued this revenue procedure in 2005 and the Department of Labor issued this primitive transaction except in the 92-6 that if you put those two things together, you can convert all your money in qualified plans to tax exempt. Next slide. You know, in, when you deal with retirement plan assets, you have to be careful because there's a lot of primitive transaction. Uh, primitive transactions are those self-dealing things. Um, but the IRS has also, excuse me, the Department of Labor has given us some exemptions to the perimeter transaction. So the example number one, can you buy beach property as an investment? Yes, that's allowed. You could buy beach property in your IRA or 401k. But an example two here, could you buy a vacation home in your account and then live in it? No, that's prohibited because you're dealing, you're self-dealing. You're living in an asset that's in your retirement plan. That you can't do, but it could be a pure investment. Another example is that uh, if you wanted to protect your family, could you buy life insurance in your qualified plan to protect your family and your business? The answer is yes, that's allowed to, to protect uh, your families in, in spite of the fact that you're personally in, uh, having insurance in your retirement account. Next slide. So the IRS also said, well, if you can do these things, uh, you know, that we're familiar with people trying to scam the IRS for uh, taxes. Um, could you buy real estate in the account? Yes, we've already talked about that. If it's worth 500,000, could you distribute that real estate and tell, only tell the IRS it's only worth 100,000? No, that's called tax evasion because if you have an asset that you bought for 100,000 in real estate that grew to 500,000, when you bring it out, it's going to, you're going to be taxed at 500,000, not the, not the 100,000. You have to pay, deal with real values. However, Revenue Procedure 2005-25 gave us a safe harbor how to price taking uh, retirement assets out of pensions and, and 401ks and IRAs. So we have these two regulations that allow us, if we put, when we put them together in a unique way, to turn qualified plan money income tax-free. Next slide. As a result of that, by repositioning these assets under the STAR system, you, you will create tax-free income for life. You know, this money will grow tax-exempt for your lifetime. And all that money inherited by your heirs will be estate tax-free as well. You also will have, never have an investment loss in the type of assets we use in this uh, STAR strategy. And as the prior speaker said, if we can take money out of retirement plan that we don't have to uh, uh, pay taxes on, then we uh, may not have to pay taxes on our social security income. So that your social security now becomes tax exempt also. Next. Here's an example of the do it, don't do it. There are three things important in a person's life. Number one is uh, how much money do I need to spend? And here's an example of our client uh, that uh, we actually put in place here. Um, so you have three sets of columns with, with two uh, uh, sub columns. One is don't do anything, stay at the status quo and, or execute the star. This individual was a high income 
and he needed $110,000 at age 68 to maintain his lifestyle. So you can see under the spendable income cash flow columns, if he doesn't, doesn't uh, do the star strategy and take taxes off the retirement account, he runs out of money at age 88. So the next question is if you're taking burning off money in lifestyle, once you've uh, spent that money, what's left over for yourself and what's left over for your family? So the next two sets of columns, the net worth and the wealth to heirs, you can see that there's nothing left over for him at age 88. There's nothing left over for his family at age 88. Whereas by taking taxes off that, you can see in the three most important areas, spendable cash flow, net worth, and wealth to heir, we, he's got income he can never outlive. In fact, his income runs to age 100, even though I only can get 40 lines on this page. And at age uh, 96, he's still got uh, $2 million in net worth and $2.1 million to go into his family. And, and the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that for every couple today that's 65, there's a 50% chance of one of them living to age 95. So one of the major principles of retirement planning is never run out of money before you run out. Next slide. Uh, we have a tax memo. A lot of uh, uh, CPAs and attorneys would like to have a tax memo of uh, this uh, details on how these two strategies and two tax codes work. And so we have this tax memo uh, written by one of the uh, America's leading pension th attorneys. In the, and uh, this uh, memo discusses the details of how and why the STAR strategy works to eliminate the taxes on retirement plan assets. And you can receive this memo by contacting uh, uh, your coach at My Financial Coach or uh, contact my office and we'll get the copy of the tax memo to you to show you how the star strategy can take taxes off your retirement plan assets for your lifetime. And thank you for uh, allowing me to speak as one of your subject matter experts. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing your star strategy and also some of the tax implications of, of the strategy as well. I know that a lot of us here are, are interested in, in learning a little bit more. So note that after this meeting or after this webinar, we will also send out an email to everyone, letting them know where all of these uh, presentation items, as well as these uh, attachments and memos will also be. So it gives me great pleasure to bring our final speaker and the headliner for uh, this webinar, uh, Dr. Arthur Laffer. I'm not as good at introducing him as, as Bill would be. So I'm going to just say that if you are all here, you probably already know who Dr. Laffer is. So uh, I will give it to Dr. Laffer. Well, thank you. I thought I was going to have to get Bill and Bo, but you put you let him off the hook, huh? All right. Thank you very much. By the way, I really enjoyed the expert speaker today. Uh, and Peter, your presentation was great. And I would love to have you, if we wouldn't mind, make sure that Bill gets a copy of your presentation, because I'd love to give your presentation. Bill, would you mind if you would just forward me those? I I, I really found them fascinating. Let, let me, if I can, go to the subject for today. And I'm going to talk to you about where we are today in politics and economics, specifically with respect to the meeting yesterday uh, between Janet Yellen, uh, uh, Powell, and President Biden in the Oval Office. And you've all read his uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal, Biden's uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you've heard him claim the Fed is independent and in all of this. And uh, I I'm just going to go through the issues with you and why what's happening is happening. Um, every president that I've ever known or been with uh, has always in, tried to interfere with the Federal Reserve Board. They, they all have. Uh, and Nixon did in 1960. Uh, he claimed that the Fed uh, really destroyed his chances for beating John F. Kennedy, and he blamed it on a rise in interest rates that narrow, narrow defeat. Kennedy won narrowly, and Nixon blamed the Fed. Uh, then in Nixon's administration, I was in that from 1970 to 1972. John Ehrlichman used to take me personally. I was in the White House at that time as George Shultz's economist, take me over to the Federal Reserve Board. We'd sit in Arthur Burns's office and he would scream at Arthur Burns to lower interest rates, lower interest rates, lower interest rates. Uh, likewise, uh, Trump, as you all know, with, with, with uh, Powell, uh, screamed and hollered to have Powell lower interest rates as well to stimulate the economy. Every president I know when, when times get tough, uh, 
really try to interfere with the Fed, and there's no exception today. And let me describe to you the, the, the current situation and just why Biden, President Biden is so panic stricken. The polls have him at the worst of any president of the last 13 uh, at today's date in their term in office, starting with Eisenhower all the way down to the present. Uh, Biden has the lowest favorable, unfavorable ratios of any president after what, a year and a quarter, year and a half, going into the midterms. Now there are five presidents who were very close to Biden, but not, not quite as bad. I mean, obviously Trump was really bad in the first two years. Uh, Reagan was really bad in the first two years. Uh, you can look at some of the others. Jimmy Carter was, Jerry Ford was. There were, there were five situations uh, that were really bad after the first two years in the polls. And what you found happening is in all five of those situations, the incumbent party of the president lost a large number of House seats. I think the average is something like 43 House seats, and they lost two or three Senate seats. Uh, with that as his sort of uh, mantra coming into this, Biden is panicked about what's going on in the election uh, in the midterms. He, he really is. Uh, he's desperately grasping for straws. And the one thing he does not want is he does not want the Fed to allow interest rates to rise, uh, to rise dramatically and cause a slowdown in the economy, a fall in the stock market. That is one thing he really does not want uh, today. And let me go through the choice we have on the Fed. And this I'm going to talk about Powell's situation. You have a balance sheet on the Fed where you have about $9 trillion in Fed assets, and you obviously have $9 trillion in Fed liabilities. Those Fed liabilities are almost all uh, claims on the Federal Reserve itself by member banks. Uh, and the assets uh, that are owned by the Fed are almost all government debt issued by the Treasury. Uh, and that government debt has been purchased by the Fed uh, and they have purchased it with the explicit purpose of keeping the price of that debt high, thereby having the interest rates very low. If the Fed were to stop buying government bonds, or if it were to sell government bonds, you can imagine what would happen. Let, let me use a hypothetical example here. Let's imagine the Fed wanted to reduce the size of its balance sheet from $9 trillion to $6 trillion and it wanted to sell $3 trillion worth of government bonds in the open market. Now, if it did that with no prospect of the Fed buying it, I mean, how much do you think a bond should yield for someone to really want to buy $3 trillion worth of those bonds today? If you've got a, a four-year bond uh, sitting out there that's yielding 2%, I, I don't think anyone would buy that bond whatsoever. What would happen is the price of that bond would have to fall very sharply. Uh, with the fall in the bond price, interest rates would rise. My guess, uh, if you were ready to let the markets clear uh, with this type of large amount of sale from the Fed's balance sheet, you would get interest rates in the 10, 12, 14, maybe even 15% range annualized uh, for four-year securities, uh, maybe even a little higher for 10 years. Uh, You've got a rate of inflation today in the United States. The latest measure was on the CPI was 8.3%. <clears throat> the previous months was 8.5%. Uh, in the next two months, you're going to see a drop in the CPI yield there a little bit. You're going to see a drop maybe to 7.9, 7, 7.8, 7, maybe 7.7, 7, because the numbers that are dropping off the annual number are very high. Uh, but that's going to happen in the next two months. In, in the next three months after those two months, you're gonna see numbers dropping off the CPI very small and there are three of them together. So by the time we get to the election in November uh, of this year, uh, there will be, have been three months where the numbers dropping off are very small with the most likely effect being that inflation rates will be picking up fairly sharply coming into the election. Biden looking at these numbers with all the poll results about, about inflation is he is desperate, he is panicked, <clears throat> and he really, really is. Now, he's tried to do a lot of things to increase his popularity, and none of them has worked yet. Uh, even, even with the land war in Europe, even with the Ukraine, uh, there was no bump in, in, in Biden's poll numbers at all. 
Uh, when you remember W, when uh, we had 9-11 and then he moved into Afghanistan, there was a huge bump in W's popularity. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, W did very well in the midterm elections of his first term in office. Uh, but there has been no bump for Biden at all. He's at the worst poll ratings right now. Well, he also thought that with the leak from the Supreme Court on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Roe versus Wade decision, that that would really excite the base and would improve his chances for election. That has not happened either. None of these has, has given him any bump whatsoever in his poll numbers. He doesn't really know what to do. One of the things he's gonna do in the next week is he's going to remove, uh, do a forgiveness plan on school debt uh, for people who have school debt, $10,000 of it. Uh, it'll be means tested, but the number I think comes out static number of revenue uh, loss, wealth loss is about $380 billion. Uh, who knows if that's going to have any effect, but I would doubt very much. <clears throat> Looking at Biden and what's the situation, he is, he is cornered. He doesn't know what to do. He is facing a very grim prospect for the economy. And I just want to remind you of an old phrase that, that I use all the time. So forgive me if you've heard it before, but uh, whenever politicians make decisions, when they are either panicked or drunk, the consequences are rarely attractive. And what you're seeing right now is a flapping around of this administration searching for policy. They've sold out of the strategic oil reserve. They're trying to do uh, 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 an excess profits tax. There are all sorts of things that are coming out of this administration. What I would expect over the next uh, three, four, five months is a flurry of policies coming out of this administration uh, that will be detrimental. I've seen them all before. Uh, as I mentioned, I was in the White House from 1970 to 1972. Uh, Nixon uh, did everything, wage and price controls, if any of you remember that. Uh, they uh, devalued the dollar. They took America off gold. They did a 10% import surcharge. They excluded foreign made capital from the investment tax credit. Uh, it was called the job development credit under Nixon. It, all of these things are a desperate attempt of a policymaker, of a president, to really recapture uh, the favorability. My guess is you're not going to see any, uh, any improvement in his favorabilities. In fact, if anything, you're going to see him get worse. Uh, I think this election in November will be a landslide for the Republicans, especially in the House. Uh, but it may also be the Republicans have a reasonable chance of even picking up the Senate, although the odds are against them. There are more Republicans seats uh, open than there are Democratic seats. But even so, uh, there are a number of people who think the Republicans will take control of the Senate as well. Uh, if that happens, if the Republicans do get control of the House and the Senate, the first thing you have to really consider and really worry about is what happens in the lame duck session. After the elections occur, and everyone knows what the new Senate and the new House will look like, uh, we will have the old Senate and the old House uh, in session for maybe two months. And there's no amount of mischief that they can't cause in that two month period uh, being headed by Schumer and, and Pelosi. There's no amount. This is the first really worrisome. And I think you wanna focus very clearly on Joe Manchin during this lame duck session and also Kristen Cinema. And the reason I say that is Joe Manchin has been in the catbird seat for probably the last year, year and a half, because of his pivotal role. Does he vote with the Democrats? Does he vote, does he vote against the Democrats? He so far has held strong. Uh, and he has not allowed the filibuster to be abandoned. And he has not allowed some of this legislation to happen. I mean, he's just done an amazing job. Kristen Cinema has done an amazing job as well. But once we get to the lame duck session, uh, Joe Manchin's future as being in a catbird seat is greatly at risk. Does he stay as a Democrat and during this uh, lame duck session uh, hold true to his previous positions? And therefore, if he gets into the new Congress, uh, he will be the most hated Democrat in that Congress and he will be absolutely powerless and without any side of, uh, of, of uh, uh, any side of uh, political power whatsoever. Same thing is true for Kristen Cinema. He has a situation that he has to uh, analyze during the lame duck session. Uh, he can roll over and become an, a Republican, or he can tend to go with the Democrats 
allow them to uh, get rid of the uh, uh, get rid of them uh, get rid of the sixty percent sixty vote majority of uh, the filibuster. If he does that, you could see some very very bad legislation coming through this session. We are in a two month very dangerous stage. I don't think we're going to have anything really terrible happen here, but I think it's really one thing you want to watch very very carefully. Uh, my guess is that you will see interest rates rising during this period. I think you'll see Biden trying to keep them down by having the Fed intervene in the markets and support uh, interest rates, support the purchase of government bonds. We're going to have a, an issuance of government bonds, something on the order of a trillion dollars a year. Uh, we have a backlog of spending that has also already been authorized. It has just not been spent yet. Uh, that's about two, two and a half trillion dollars. So we have a huge clash coming in the next oh, six, seven, eight months of uh, where a lot of debt will be issued onto the market. Uh, you're going to have the forgiveness of the bonds by, by Biden. You're going to have the deficit. Plus, you'll have the authorized funds that have not yet been spent. Uh, and this will be a, a huge dilemma for the Fed, because as far as I can tell, this inflation is by no means over. Uh, I don't know how high it can get, but I lived through the late 1970s being very close to the White House, being very close in politics. And le let me just say that when those inflation rates start going, they don't stop and they increase at an ever increasing rate. Just for the record, on January 20th, 1981, the day we took office, uh, the prime interest rate in the United States was 21 and a half percent. The inflation rate was 14, 15, 16 percent. Mortgage rates were 18, 19 percent. If any of you remember or could read history books, I mean, the Federal Reserve effective discount rate was something like 19 and a half percent. And it wasn't stopping. Uh, the only way Paul Volcker ever got control of inflation was allowing interest rates to rise to those levels. That is the only way I can see of stopping this situation uh, is letting them rise. Now, I, I'm going to let the politics go from there. Once the Republican House and Senate uh, takes office, which is in early January uh, 2023, uh, when they do, you will have a buy, you'll have a split uh, administration. Joe Biden still has a lot of options as president of the United States. He has executive orders, all sorts of things he can do. Uh, none of which I view will be attractive. Uh, I think that will be a very contentious period. Uh, the Republicans have a thing. By the time we get to 2024 and we get a presidential election in November, I think you're going to see a great president elected. I think you're going to see a very powerful uh, Congress, Republican House and Senate. And I think really great policies will be put into effect, but they won't come into place. They'll, you know, they'll take office on January 20th. Uh, 2025, that's when the new president will take office. It'll take a year for legislation to get through. The earliest you can expect to see major policy changes from what we have now will really be about, I mean, I would guess 2026, maybe uh, if it's delayed like it was under Reagan to 2027. So we have a long period here of, I think, very poor economic policy. Uh, and it's a period that we all have to make it through. Uh, that's why I love being on the board of, of, of this company, my financial coach, and being with Bill for years and years, is these, uh, these experts are really great and can really make a huge difference in your lives and how much you get to keep. It's really important. Now, on a public policy, what do I wish would happen? Number one, I wish the Fed would stop buying any debt whatsoever. And I wish the Fed would then sell off part of their balance sheet of $9 trillion, maybe down to $7 trillion and let interest rates seek their natural level uh, in the marketplace, which would, I think, be very high. Let's say you get a 10-year bond yield of maybe something like 12, 13%. But that is the only way I can see, uh, I can see inflation ever coming back under control. Otherwise, I believe the inflation rate will keep rising uh, until such a policy is done. Number two, I would like to see the Treasury and the administration sequester all sorts, sequester or impound, all sorts of uh, authorizations that have been already voted on, but impound those so that they're not spent in there. That would be a holding back of spending and reducing it maybe by two or two and a half, three trillion dollars. Uh, there are lots of other good policies near them that that'll have to wait for the, for the Republican administration. But number two, number three, 
I would love to see the administration. I think they can do this. I would see the love to see the administration uh, abandon Build Back Better now. I think if Biden did that presently, I think that would raise him in the polls. I think it would be considered a very fiduciarily sound move for him to do. I don't think he'll do it, but I do think that would be good. Uh, the next one, number four, I think for Biden to do a good job here, I think he should reverse his energy policies. I think he should go back and re reverse his decision on the uh, XL Keystone XL pipeline, open up the reserves to, for the U.S. to drill oil. All of you have heard these arguments ad nauseum, but the U.S. is much cleaner at drilling oil. We have all this oil below the ground. Uh, we can get that out. It'll take a while for it to come back on stream, but that will have a very major impact on reversing the inflation rise there. Uh, I also think that the U.S. should reduce or lower trade barriers. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about trade barriers on mili military equipment and that sort of stuff, but you know, the U.S., by using trade barriers as a political tool, using tariffs and quotas for, as a political tool, we have made ourselves quite unpopular. People love clients. I mean, every one of you loves your client. I love my clients. God, I love being paid. I think they're wonderful. I want to hug and kiss them, send them flowers, do all sorts of stuff. If people prohibit and drop me as a client, I, I don't like them nearly as much. That's true on a global scale as well. I think the U.S. should make trade with as many countries as they possibly can, including China. In fact, almost especially China, because I think it's really going to be a long run political issue here of the U.S. trying to win over friends in this world economy. Uh, and I think tariffs are a very major reason why it, from time to time people dislike the U.S. One of the things that's popped out recently with the baby milk formula that has occurred is the FDA is out of control. Uh, I think Biden should reprimand, if not terminate, uh, the members of the Federal Drug and, uh, Administration there and really uh, have investigations into how they made those decisions there. The, the last thing I think Biden can do uh, that would make the world a lot better right now, I, I don't think he will do this either, but what he can do is he can provide an off-ramp for the Soviets, for Russia to get out of Ukraine. Uh, there is nothing that would help the markets and the economy more today than if there were a ceasefire in Ukraine and we could get the Soviets to the negotiating table or whatever. They need an off-ramp off to be able to get out of that. But let me just say that the outlook for the US economy over the next six, seven, eight months before the elections is not good. I think we're going to see higher interest rates. I think we're going to see higher inflation. And I think we're going to see a weakening in the capital markets during that period. I think the election results will be very favorable for the Republicans, both in the House and the Senate. We have a very scary period there of the, uh, of the uh, lame duck session. And then we have a battle period for the next two years before the presidential race of November 2024. I think that will be also a contentious period. Uh, but during that period, I think the Republicans will pick up steam. And I think once we get through the elections of, no of November 2024, I think the world looks a lot better. And by the time we get to 2026, my view is that the U.S. will be postured for one of the greatest periods of prosperity uh, the U.S. has ever seen. And from my standpoint, the reason I love doing all of this with all of you is I think you are one of the most sophisticated audiences around. And these these experts are really very good. I followed her with a number of them historically, and it's just amazing. And Bill, with, with that, I'm going to throw it open for questions, MPO, MPO for questions, and uh, uh, if you guys have any for me or anything. But again, Tom and, and Peter, great job today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Laffer, always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I do have a few questions that have been put into the chat. Uh, just a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, they can always send it over to me for any of our panelists today. Uh, the first one actually goes to Dr. Laffer. Uh, Dr. Laffer, as you know, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in this world today, whether it's geopolitical, uh, domestic politics, and also the reactions to it in the marketplace. Uh, if you would say what the greatest concern that you have for whether it is inflation or if it's a geopolitical threat, what would you say is the greatest concern that people going into retirement 
what what do you feel is going to be the thing that should make them the most concerned? Uh, and and it could be anything from the, from geopolitical, of course, to economic. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you what you think the greatest concern should be. And if I'm if I'm your average American, what should I be doing? What what, what are some of the things I can do to protect myself? What are some of the things that that I should really really be thinking about during this time? Yeah, let, let me not talk about a retirement, at least of any time soon, Info, if, if that's all right. Uh, you know, and what I'd like to say is that during these times when politicians are acting in aberrant ways, uh, and this is a classic case, it's the Nixon uh, situation in Camp David. It's a, you've seen it with Jimmy Carter. I mean, panic there. He did. I mean, you remember the gas lines, the wellhead uh, price controls. You had the not circulating the air, uh, forcing planes to circulate air in there, 55 mile hour. I can't begin to tell you all the types of stupid policies these people can do. Uh, they can do them very easily. I mean, if you go back to the years 1971, 73, 74, they were prosecuting Americans for taking gold over the border into Mexico or into other countries where it was legal for Americans to hold that gold. I mean, they were going after these people. You know, these are things that you can't even imagine today. Uh, all of these would be there. All I would suggest is when you look at assets, think of it in a politically very unstable environment, Empo, and imagine the types of, of conjurings that can come up in a room, in the Roosevelt room with bright people figuring out how they can stop people from making profits, how they can take their money, all of this stuff. You know, there is no easy way during a downturn, during a slow period of making money. Uh, if everything goes fine, there are lots of easy ways of doing it. I mean, but believe me, they will be trying to close those policies and close those options. So be very careful, uh, be spread out in your diversified funds, but don't think for a moment uh, that you can avoid being damaged by a really bad economy. And let me let me give you the example here from January uh, from February uh, February 1966. The Dow Jones Industrial Average peaked uh, intraday peak right up to a thousand. Okay, in February 66, the Dow hit a thousand. Uh, in August 13th. 1982, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average troughed at 777. Now, let me just say what this is. For 16 and a half years, all right, February 66 to August 7, uh, 1981, all right, to 82, excuse me, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by 22.3%. But that doesn't count the trebling of the price level. If you take into account the real value of the Dow, the Dow in August 13th, 1982 was at 235. So it went from 1,000 to 235 in 16 and a half years. That, down, that was down 76 and a half percent in real terms in 16 and a half years. That's an average annual compound rate of return of minus 7% per annum, 16 and a half years long. That's a bear market. What I would suggest is that in the near term, until we start getting clarity as to what these things, people should be very cautious on what type of assets they go into and make sure that they have enough situation to protect themselves from any really ab abnormal untoward event. Absolutely. So, Dr. Laffer, we are getting closer to the top of the hour. Do you happen to have time for one more question? Of course. But yes, any, any question thrown towards me, I'd love it. Okay, excellent. That's what I love about this, these, these webinars. Absolutely. So, when it comes to a recession, that's a, a very scary word, and it, it gets thrown around all the time on TV, uh, but Putting aside the viewership ratings and and all the things that that word can conjure up, uh, when it comes to an actual recession, what do you feel is the likelihood of it? And, and what does that look like for the average person? Yeah, the word recession uh, is a funny word, and you're right. It, you know, up <laughs> and TV and all that. The definition of a recession, which is a stupid definition, there's you know anyone could define it. it was defined by the National Bureau of Economic Research. 
I think back in 1948 or something like that, it's two down quarters in GDP. So far, last quarter, GDP declined by 1.5%. That's the revised new number. Uh, I don't expect it to decline this next quarter, but it's not gonna be great. Uh, so it, when you look at this, we are going to have a very slow growth at best, Empo, uh, for coming forth. The jobs will not be being created. Uh, the participation rate in the US is very, very low. Uh, if you look at all of that, uh, I don't see anything that will cause real GDP in the economy to be there. So what you're going to look at, it's not just having jobs, is people have been all leaving the labor force. They're not even in the labor force because of all the welfare spending that was done by this administration and bailing. And if they had a job they didn't like, Empo, they just left. And they, they had enough assets because of the government spending to make them through. And this is a low income workers have done that. And that's why our participation rate is so very low. I don't see any of that reversing for quite a while, especially if interest rates go up and the Fed does that, that will slow down on capital spending, uh, the regulations, the restrictions, the oil restrictions, the gas prices, all of that will slow the economy down. Uh, I, while I don't know whether we're gonna have a recession per se or not, the official definition, I would think that the economy is gonna grow very slowly for the next couple of years because of really bad policies. Uh, you know, Too much taxes, You've got all these illusory taxes on capital gains because of appreciation and assets, because of inflation, not because of real return, but you still have to pay taxes on them. Uh, you'll have pushing people into higher brackets, especially corporations, and you'll have under depreciation of capital equipment on corporations, which raise the corporate tax rate back up a little bit. You have all these other things there. Uh, government spending is still way, way, way too high. The new norm now is 24% of GDP. That's just federal. It used to be 20%. Uh, and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, you look at uh, uh, inflation, unsound money, that's about as high a situation we've had since the 1970s. Uh, you've got free trade being threatened all over the place. So, uh, and lastly, regulations have been imposed all over the economy, not only from COVID-19, but following that, there are all sorts of regulations and restrictions and requirements have been put on. So there are none of the sort of intrinsic conditions of government's relationship with the economy that would have me believe, Empo, that we're going to have anything other than very slow growth, if not a recession, over the next couple of years. And that will be obviously very bad. And that's when you've really got to watch for your portfolios and make sure you're very careful with your portfolios because um, there's nothing less fun than losing all your assets. Well, maybe, maybe dying. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Laffer, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, for all of the participants today, we want to thank you for coming and joining us for this discussion. We will make sure to have all of the recording of this event sent out to everyone, as well as any of the attachments, memos, presentations, and slides sent out. Uh, once more, my financial coach, very glad to have been able to host this event with Dr. Laffer. Uh, if you have any questions that we did not get to, we will try to get answers to that to you going forward. And we will hope to see you on the next one.